Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahirabbilalamin. Assalatu wassalamu wa ambiya bar musallin. Allahumma salli ala sayidina Muhammad fatil makhluk wal khatli ma sabak nasul haq bi haq wal hadi la siratan mustaqim wa ala alihi haqqul daril azim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh everyone wherever you are watching this live on Sauk Ilahi. Uh, may peace be upon you. We pray that you are in good health, well-being and inshallah in the state of good iman. We always pray for all of you, inshallah. Uh, tonight, uh, welcome to another online event session with Saw Ilahi. And tonight is an interesting uh, session. We have a beautiful guest, uh, important man actually in our community because he helped us to deal with the law and understand, uh, make us understand about the law and everything. Uh, he is none other than uh, Mr. Abdul Rahman from uh, Abdul Rahman Law Corporation. Assalamualaikum, sir. How are you? Waalaikumsalam, salam, Rasulullah. Good, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, mashallah. Uh, we know Mr. Abdul Rahman three years ago in 2017 when we were organizing uh, the domestic violence or spouse abuse uh, campaign. And Mr. Abdul Rahman is one of the uh, person who support us, his company also, uh, in creating this awareness on uh, domestic violence or spouse abuse. And mashallah, we also work with him quite a number of times and he's been uh, helping us, sponsoring us and, you know, a lot of things in our uh, Islamic Fine Arts uh, Film Festival and also Sacred Pavlov, mashallah, may Allah preserve him. He's indeed uh, one of the blessing people in our community that we can seek guidance on law and everything but before we start this uh you know important topic and i think a lot of us always forget uh, this sort of thing is rampantly happening right uh, from my experience uh for 10 years uh organizing south ilahi event whether it's sacred power of love which is our annual event and this year will be 11 year but because of the pandemic uh, it's going to be online. But for the past eight years, we saw the increased number of uh, domestic violence, abuse in marriage or relationship. So tonight we're going to talk about spouse abuse, right? Marriage turns to violence. Okay, before we start with uh, Mr. Abdul Rahman, uh, I'd like to ask my wife, who is here with me, uh, what is your view after the voice out campaign how was the response from our community and also uh, the the way how they find this campaign um, everyone. Um, i think the voice out anti-domestic abuse campaign um, actually we started it because we saw a lot of people asking about uh, domestic abuse in our events for many many years uh, we thought that it was a good time to start a campaign for the community. Um, so the response, as as uh, expected, um, we do get a lot of people coming forward and saying like, okay, they some of them were abused. Others have friends who or family members who are undergoing abuse. So it does help them to create awareness. But of course, you know, domestic abuse is a long time issue. It's not going to be solved just like that. And uh, even now, when we do events after the voice out campaign, we do uh, we do still get people who come forward for help. Um, that's where we channel them to the right uh, help, either to see lawyers or to go to FSC. So um, this thing is something that is continuing but uh, it's important to actually keep the conversation going uh, to always you know uh, even to dispel certain myths um, especially in the religious circle uh, about what um, what uh, you can or cannot do to your spouse and there's a few misconceptions there so it's important to keep this conversation going and we are not we are not talking about eliminating uh, domestic violence. I mean, it, it's usually something that you know it goes on generation after generation. But at least when we have these conversations, you know, um, it's a start so that you know at least the victims can get help. 
Alhamdulillah, masya Allah. Okay, uh, we're gonna start as the asking the lawyer uh, on this. It's very important. Uh, I hope you can like and share because this involve a lot of people. It may be your family member or it might be your friends. And this is one of the reasons why we started Voice Out campaign. Uh, the Voice Out campaign is not for the victims merely. It's for the people around the victims so that they can help the victims. And there's a lot of confusion going on, like uh, Ainun was saying. So here we have this conversation with a lawyer so that you can understand how to go about in such circumstances, which is important for the victims, for her or his sanity, right? And also mental abuse people from our experience, uh, after they went through such trauma or pain, they'll never be the same again, right? So uh, Mr. Abdul Rahman, this first question right, is a common question, but I think this is something need to be highlighted online in a community to understand. Every couple has their fair share of argument and disagreement. Sometimes this argument may become heated and either or both parties might become rude or hostile. This may or may not constitute spousal abuse. In the eyes of the law, right? what exactly constitutes spousal abuse and in your professional opinion and experience, at what point do you advise people to seek legal aid in their situation? Okay, so assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, having me on your platform today. I mean, I'm, I'm happy and uh, I'm also very humbled to be sharing here with you, uh, especially to your audience and to the people that you uh, uh, constantly reach out to and constantly help. So uh, the topic today, of course, is uh, something that's very heavy, but yet close to all of our hearts, because I don't think anyone, anyone can stand for abuse and nobody wants uh, anyone they love or care for to actually go through any process of abuse. So uh, to, to, to dive in straight to the, the question that you posed to me, what is the legal requirements? Arguably, uh, this would be something that's actually found in the Women's Charter. And if my memory serves me right, this is in actually section um, 65 of the Women's Charter, where it's a three-pronged approach. It's either violence, uh, harassment, violence or harassment, and there must be some form of necessity. So basically, uh, there's a there's a separation between the, the 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 idea of violence and also the idea of harassment because this actually covers arguably different areas or different aspects. For example, whether it's physical abuse or whether it's going to be mental abuse, uh, emotional abuse, uh, and and this would probably straddle the two different uh, requirements. Now, if it was physical abuse, there's definitely going to be some form of violence, and usually. When we are in court, this is uh, established either, either through medical reports or police reports or eyewitness accounts of what had happened, whether someone had seen uh, the spouse being beaten up or being physically abused, for example. Uh, sometimes also, I mean now with, with current, current day availability of information and whatnot, we can always easily uh, take photos using our handphones in a situation where one spouse has uh, beaten or, or physically abused the other. And this should be followed up with uh, either a police report, like I said, uh, th that's going to be contemporaneous evidence as well, and also a medical report that I referred to earlier, because uh, you should go and get a medical examination ASAP. And this, again, will corroborate uh, any allegation of physical abuse against the spouse. Now. Uh, but apart from physical abuse as well, there's, there's um, other forms of, of abuse as well. For example, um, mental language, there's, uh, there's, there's, there's emotional language, there's all of uh, these other types of uh, common um, uh, belittling of, of your partner and whatnot. That could potentially fall under the ambit of, uh, of harassment as well. So because of that, there, there are options when you make such an, an application, for example, for a personal protection order in the family court. Um, I would also say that uh, when we are talking about abuse, uh, it goes beyond spouses as well. I mean, 
okay, uh, we, between spouses alone, uh, physical abuse is one thing, but some there, there are common situations where I have seen personally uh, individuals who are so who are so good at, 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 at what they do and how they do it. They, they can methodically, for example, finish off their wife's money so that the wife doesn't have any form of uh, financial independence. And then they isolate the wife by not letting her go out of the house. And then they also take away forms of communications by not letting the wife uh, speak to her family or speak to her loved ones or to speak to her friends. So all of this then creates a dependence on the, the, the abuser, right? And this this a common um, this is a common approach or modus operandi when it comes to abusing spouses, and and that usually extends towards physical abuse after that methodical uh, uh, approach towards uh, I would say arguably removing the identity of the woman, right? So. Um, if if a person is is going through all of this and experience all experiencing all this, definitely they should they should go and get help. They should go and get assistance, uh, and also explore the the legal route because that's the most important thing that they have to do. Uh, but apart from that, between spouses as well, we we are aware right now in Singapore there are instances of abuse of, uh, for example, elderly as well, elderly parents. Uh, there's also unfortunately too many reports of abuse against children as well, and that's the most heart wrenching. Uh, and horrible to read. So uh, these are things that we are aware of that can currently happen. So the second you see or hear or such things, I would encourage it to be reported and uh, whatever legal aid, as you mentioned earlier, that can be available to you should be immediately explored. Inshallah, so much that you describe, and I think uh, perhaps, you know, I was unaware of it, all the situation that it thank you for uh elaborating more on this because i think people often take chances and say like oh it's okay just you know one off or one situation but i just want to go with you first also before i continue with uh mr abdul rahman right what make you think uh why why you think not what you think why you think victims always fall on to those who abuse them despite knowing that the per the abuser whether it's husband or wife or children right are not going to change at all i think it's a bit complex um some of them they stay because of their children they feel that that is the best for their children so that's why they stay um others if they don't have children sometimes it's just um they they go through a, like a sense of sympathy for for the person because the person will say i'm sorry usually the it's a cycle right so they will say i'm sorry or he or she will say i'm sorry and then i'll not do it again but then it happens again so the hope that you know things will change eventually um i mean there's a lot of other reasons but uh it's important to know that uh, these kind of situations especially if it's a uh, physical it can escalate. So it can escalate to something that's worse. Um, and that's why it's always recommended for them to seek help. Because if they if they don't, you do not know. Like some people actually they die from domestic violence, right? Um yeah, I I, I have seen cases where you know someone hold their partner um on the ledge, on the parapet. And I mean, that, that's something scary, you know, you can die from such an incident. So that's why it's important for you to, um, to come forward to seek help. And the process, I think, is uh, not just straight away, you know, you, uh, you, everything will happen straight away, um, like your children will be taken away or things like that. So there's the process as well. So um, it's important not to be afraid to come forward because uh it's not like if you have children it's not like you're going to lose your children straight away and then you know everything will fall down for you and i think the we have uh, family violence uh specialist centers that you can go to and they can give you both emotional and also um they can show you the way to the legal support as well um yeah Thank you. And I think uh, uh, Mr. Abdul Rahman, as Ainun was saying about 
all this uh, situation that they are in, they are very helpless. They are not able to do something for themselves, right? So the question is like, you know, our community also like very taboo, especially those religious inclined or religious circle. They will say like, oh, you cannot open aib. You know, you are committing a sin. You are doing this uh, not good. You enter hell because you are against your husband, for example, right? And these people tend to be skeptical or scared in moving forward. So, but but the question also that uh, some, most people also don't even know how to go about, like say, wait, let's say, okay, now I'm ready to help my sister or my uh, brother or even my good friend. So how do I go about with it in looking for help? What are the most important thing that a spouse, victims, friends or her, her or himself need to know when he or she he or she seek legal aid okay so um, that's actually a, a relatively long uh, question and uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a few parts to it uh, okay but so first you start by saying um, sometimes this is a taboo topic uh, but I will, I will say I disagree to me this is not a taboo topic this is basic uh, this is basic human rights. We all deserve to be safe. We all deserve to not be subject to any forms of, 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 of abuse. So I don't believe that uh, it is taboo and it should not be taboo in our community. Uh, of course, there is a perception that you must always respect your husband and whatnot. But respect goes two ways. Your husband needs to respect you as well. It's not just about um, you doing well for your husband and tutup ayat and whatnot. Ayat is one thing, but him beating you up is another so I, 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 I'm not a Asapiza, I'm not a religious uh, educator. I can't confirm nor uh, deny any issue with, it, with, with in regards to religion. But I have gone to multiple courses where, where many different Asapizas have given commentary on this issue and, and they are all uh, often of the same uh, position in that uh, violence is not something that is to be tolerated, especially within our religion. So that's the first thing, right? And the second part of the question is what to do uh, when you think you are ready. Okay, now, and then you also ask as a third part of your question is, uh, as a third part of your question, what can we as friends or third parties who are observing this do, right? So if you think you are ready or you think uh, it, the, the violence or the abuse or whatever it is that you're experiencing has reached a point where where finally you hit realization and you say, this is enough, it's enough, I'm not going to go through this anymore. Uh, it's definitely important for you to take the right steps. Um, depending on what actually happened, whether it's violence against you, whether it's violence against your children, whether it's against the elderly and whatnot, there's, there are many different things that can be done, right? Now, of course, if it's against a spouse or a child, you can go to the family courts uh, to file an application for a uh, for personal protection order, uh, you can actually, if I if I remember correctly, you can actually go online now and uh, and and book an appointment for this, or you can go straight to court itself uh, to do the application uh, over the counter in in court. What's important is when you make this application, you must always be prepared with uh, whatever circumstantial evidence that you have on hand immediately. For example, like I mentioned, police reports, medical reports from doctors photos of, of what had happened and a clear commentary of what happened uh, is very, very important because all these go, will go towards your likelihood of obtaining what is called an expedited order. Basically, an expedited order is an almost immediate PPO that you get while waiting for the matter to be heard uh, or, or to be tried in court uh, eventually. So that, that it's important for you to, to produce and show whatever evidence you have and also even more important for you to actually uh, explain what happened very clearly so that the duty judge who is accepting the application can consider whether an expedited order should be given or not in the circumstances. So that's important. Now, if uh, that, that applies to, to, to uh, be it men or women and also children, if you're members of the elderly, 
and you are being subject to some form of abuse, definitely uh, you can also go through the PPO route if it's against your your, your child or, or the one who's conducting or who's meeting out the abuse against you is a family member. Uh, apart from that, there are also other forms of uh, protection. For example, you can go for uh, prevention of harassment. That's a separate regime altogether. And that may apply sometimes against uh, for the elderly against family members who insist on asking you for money or harassing you for money. Uh, and this uh, surprisingly often happens as well. Uh, apart from that, also, uh, as an elderly, there, might, there may be other things that you might want to explore, for example, the maintenance of parents and whatnot. Uh, so all, all these are options that are available. Now, uh, most importantly, sometimes you may be lost in the information uh, that is available online. There's a lot of information online usually. Uh, if you can't get what you want or if you can't get clarity in, in, in terms of what's happening to you, you can always go down to the multiple free legal clinics that are all over the island, right? And legal clinics are basically, uh, all you need to do is register and you'll get maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes to meet a lawyer, just go through quickly what your situation is and the lawyer will usually be able to give you free advice immediately on hand what needs to be done so that you can take the relevant steps after that. Uh, so these are things to answer the second part of your question. These are things that immediately can be done. You can proceed to make the necessary applications. And if uh, you think you need guidance or clarity, you can always go to any uh, free legal clinic to get uh, to just bounce ideas and confirmation as to what needs to be done immediately after that. Now, third part of your question was what can be done if we as friends and family um, notice that someone that we know is going through this. Uh, now, uh, as third party, sometimes it's difficult to speak up. Uh, we don't want to say the obvious. We don't want to make matters worse uh, for people that we actually care about. But the best thing to do is to actually voice out and tell them, look, you're not alone. You don't have to be alone uh, going through this, this abuse, going through this difficulty in your life. As a third party, whether I'm a friend, whether I'm a colleague, whether I'm a a family member, a relative and whatnot, I am here for you. I can be here for you if you need me to. Uh, and let's take those, those first steps together, whether it's um, going to see a lawyer, going to see a, a medical practitioner, getting some form of uh, expert advice. <coughs> Sometimes people just need that, that first step, that first, the, those first words of encouragement uh, to push them in the right direction. So I think it's important for us to be brave enough uh, to, to say to someone that we can be there for you if you need us to. <coughs> uh, uh, your voice is, is... Okay, sorry. My voice is off. Okay. <laughs> Okay, um, I was asking about verbal abuse. Um, you know, physical abuse is easy for you to maybe get photographs and things like that, and there's medical report. But for verbal abuse, it's a bit more. I mean, you can you can get uh messages, right? You can get print screen of messages. But um, is there a guideline on how far will the court look at it as verbal abuse, and how do they determine that it's if uh it's affecting them and and you know, if if you if the person just call you stupid every day, will that be enough for the court to accept? Well, verbal abuse is never just verbal, right? It's usually arguably emotional as well. It could be some form of mental abuse as well. And uh, I guess the question is usually the consistency, how often it happens, and to what extent. Now, if if in a six-year marriage, the husband just calls in anger, calls his wife stupid or what, maybe three times out of six years, then it's difficult for us to go into, to, to, to be establishing any form of a case. But if in a, in a six-month marriage, every single day, the woman is being subjected to a barrage of insults, not let's not just say stupid, but a barrage of different insults, you, you lousy person, you gold digger, you useless, you this, you that. And these are the common uh, types of... of, of, of of um, heckles that sometimes men give their wives. Why? I don't know. Why would you want to stay married if if you don't love your wife and you want to call her all those names, then might as well part ways, right? So, but this, these things happen. So, 
uh, when it is that way, when it is so often so intense uh, that you can get evidence of it and evidence of its consistency, this will definitely at least become some form of harassment. And that would be one of the limbs that I discussed earlier on establishing the case for a personal protection order. So uh, as long as it happens often enough, that should be enough for us to establish it. Thanks, uh, Mr. Abdul Rahman. But before uh, we proceed on, uh, you can message us any question or so along the way. Uh, we, we're going to be an hour only. So you have to message us now, 906-87106. Relevant question to the topic so that I can address either Mr. Abdul Rahman or Sister Ainun. Right? So uh, just sidetrack a bit because just now I saw a question coming in. I'm going to Ainun. Uh, because since you mentioned mental abuse, verbal abuse, so it's correlated verbal and mental, right? So <coughs> people question, there's one question, and I sort of relate every event, we always have this similar kind of question where people will question like, uh, how do we know that this is mental abuse, right? By, is it just by label, calling like just now, like stupid, bodoh, bongo, uh, you know? Tanah mampu, you know that kind of thing. So, how how is it then? And from your experience in knowing the victims and what you have learned in your social psychology and all that, how far can people understand that they cannot take it or this is a normal thing? You know, my husband angry or my wife angry is okay. Um, okay. I think Sorry. I think um, when we talk about uh. Like I think Mr. Abraman explained about the legal aspect, right? What the uh, how often it happens. Um, in terms of how you detect it as a layman, it's actually usually the person has a change in personality. So maybe they used to be someone who likes to go out and likes to be with their friends, and then suddenly they become isolated. They do not want to meet anyone, or they become depressed. So these are signs, and usually the ones who can actually uh, see these signs are their family and friends. And that's why it's important for family and friends to come in to help. Um, because even they themselves sometimes may not be able to detect that, okay, I'm experiencing uh, verbal abuse and it's affecting me. So that's why I always uh, emphasize the importance of people actually coming in to us. You know, uh, how are you? What's going on? Uh, why is your behavior changing? Um, so that's one way for you to to really see because verbal abuse is something that you cannot see. So it's a bit more you know vague sometimes. Um, but that, that's why I say it's important to notice how a person behaves. And if if you should ask, uh, basically they sometimes they think like, okay, I don't want to ask because I don't want to be capo. But then it's your family and your friends, and if you are not asking or the community is not uh, coming in, then nobody is going to help them because some of these victims when they are facing it, they are like in a bubble, so they keep thinking like, you know, nothing is wrong. They don't see it outside. So, uh, yeah, that's one of the things that they need to think of. I think the problem is also like what you said, uh, don't be kipo. It's a personal space. You know, it's between family and friends. Oh, sorry. Between family, you know, husband and wife is common. Uh, you know, every now and then you hear. But they don't see the effect of that word negativity that is coming to their mind. And it's like, you know, uh, sort of, I would say, inner destroying their thoughts, their sanity, you so, right? Because you don't see the effect of what you said to people actually hurt them, right? Even friend also, sometimes when we joke, you know, overzealously, it affect them. But we always say, takkan tak tahan maju, you know, I'm laju, you know, that kind of thing. But you don't see that people also have self-esteem. I think this is very important. Uh, for those who are watching this, to take note of this. And never ever undermine if you look at the environment or the person itself and you think like, man, this is not right the way how you call your spouse. And I think that you, if you are a person to that friend 
who said that kind of not a good word to his or her spouse, then we should advise personally to them and said, hey, you know, you should change the way how you do it, right? I think this is the appropriate adapt. Adapt is the key to harmonious family. Uh, getting back to Mr. Abdurrahman, just now you're mentioning about all the effects and what people should do. Uh, usually we heard the story about women being the victims. Even in my experiences at South Ilahi, I would say 90% are women, 10% are men. So what is your experience on men? And uh, what would you like to say about abuse on men in marriage or relationship or, you know, even parents' situation? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's not a one-way street. It doesn't mean that just because you're a man, you cannot be abused. Uh, I've seen instances of, of men who have been physically, physically abused. Of course, a man is stronger. Men, arguably, I'm not, I'm not being sexist or gender biased, but arguably the, the physical make of a man may mean that he is he's stronger, he's able to take more and whatnot. But that doesn't mean that he's a punching bag. And that unfortunately sometimes happens in a marriage. And I've seen men get injured. I've seen men being subject to things like, um, like when in fights, uh, a wife slams the door on the man's fingers. I've seen a man lose a a quarter of his of his finger because of this uh, and this uh, is just an example of the constant abuse uh, i've also had interestingly a situation where there was this couple uh, i still remember this distinctly uh, where the wife actually took out a, a ppo application against the husband uh, the husband thought that the case was going to be i mean they were going going to go through the process of divorce he consented to the ppo uh, and then what happened was she would show up at his workplace, she would insist to sit beside him, she would do all kinds of harassment by showing up wherever it is that he is, uh, and then call the police on him, and then he would, be have, he would have to go through the process of questioning and whatnot. And 90% of the time, the police would then let him go because he would be able to establish that he didn't do uh, any anything against her, he didn't breach the PPO and whatnot, but because uh, of her constant reports, it became almost a, a, a form of harassment against him. So um, it is definitely not a one-way street. Uh, the circumstances generally, I would say, is different, of course. When it comes to physical abuse, I think uh, it's a lot more common to see that a, a man commits a physical abuse against a woman. But I would say maybe 5 to 10% of the cases, there are situations where the woman uh, beats the man or is physically violent against the man as well. Uh, there are also other instances where uh, different forms of abuse, for example, uh, mental uh, kind of anguish or, or emotional kind of anguish that is uh, methodically structured against the man as well. I, I've seen this happening. Uh, it is not uncommon. So uh, to any gentleman who's watching, don't, don't, don't feel aggrieved or feel uh, upset or feel that there's no avenue for you, even for men, uh, you have the right to avail yourself of the law. And if you are caught in a situation of abuse, uh, whichever way that abuse is, you can get yourself the protection as well as you should get yourself the protection. So there's nothing to worry, fear, or be ashamed of that to me. That's my view. Thank you. I think uh, for the past few weeks, actually, uh, fated by Allah that I met quite a number of men who shared with me this sort of story, uh, the same story that you, sh you you share. I have one question also, just come in about PPO, uh, Mr. Abdurrahman. But this is a guy, uh, he's asking. He said that uh, his ex-wife to be soon using uh, PPO on him through the arguments that they, ha they had, uh, saying that uh, emotional abuse, uh, right? But he said that he has never been in such a state because he always care for his family and that. So that's one side of it, lah, of course. we not too sure about it. You know, we have to hear both sides. But what would your advice be for someone who goes through that sort of situation saying that it's not fair, it's only one side that story. Uh, what would your advice for such drama or such situation? 
So this would be advice to a third party, is it, or a family member or someone who's trying to help? I think most probably for both lah, because now the guy is saying that uh, it's unjust this PPO on him because he doesn't do any harm. But the wife is using, you know, sometimes you when you are in a heated argument, you may say something, maybe vulgarity or whatever, but you don't mean it in 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 that sort of abuse mentally, like what we mentioned. But it's just out of heated argument, both sides was giving, you know, not a good word. So he was asking about himself, lah. Much like what should he do now that he having a PPO? Would he lose his custody, share custody, and so on? Okay, so um, advice when it comes to the PPO, um, I, I, it, it's a bit, it's a bit difficult to answer this. But basically, if the circumstances not were not met, the other party, the wife or whoever it is, the other party would not be getting the PPO in the first place. The courts are quite strict about this, and I have full confidence in our legal system. Generally speaking, uh, without establishing the actual limbs that is required under the under Section 65 of the Women's Charter, uh, it will not be so easy for someone to just get the PPO just like that, unless you consented to it. So, if you consented to it, then you only have yourself to blame, right? That's why I always say before you even enter the courtroom, go and get. Legal advice. Go and speak to any independent lawyer that you can. Like I said, there's so many people who are willing to help, uh, and you can always uh, avail yourself of the services uh, available at the legal clinic and whatnot. Just to actually understand what your rights are before you consent or before you agree to anything in the first place. So it's important to make sure that happens, because uh, to address uh, what was uh, brought up in the question, if you do not Establish the grounds. You are not going to be able to get the PPO just like that. So, as defending parties, we 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 can be rest assured that the court is only going to give the applicant the PPO if they actually uh, successfully establish it, uh, and not just situations of you know like like what Brother Halit said. If uh, once in a while you 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 get angry or you accidentally scold someone or in a in a moment of anger you actually blurt something out. It doesn't qualify as something that is, uh, that is, that is constant or, or or commonly happening. The second limb that I mentioned in the in the PPO requirements also is that of necessity. So necessity basically means uh, the PPO will only be ground, granted in situations where you actually need it for 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 your protection. It is, uh, for example, in situations where parties are still residing in the same house or when they have children and they still need to change uh, exchange access times and whatnot then yes there may be a necessity but if for example parties have moved apart they don't see each other anymore and whatnot then that necessity requirement would not be met and you would not be able to get the ppo as easily as well now the last last thing you mentioned uh, brother is that you asked about uh, custody right now Custody is a whole other thing. Uh, and I think some time ago, many people were under the misconception that, oh, if I'm going through divorce proceedings, I better file a PPO so that uh, I have some grounds against my husband, for example. That That is a misconception. It is not true and it's not accurate at all. You shouldn't abuse the court's process and you shouldn't tax the court unnecessarily with frivolous applications. If there's no abuse, then don't file for a PPO, please, because you are just taking away someone else's time, someone who actually may need that assistance. So uh, I think that's very irresponsible if we do that. Um, custody, care, and control of children uh, is separate issues altogether, and the court generally uh, will look at uh, look at it from a case to case basis. Now, custody refers to long term decision making rights, things like. Uh, education, healthcare, religion, medical treatment, all of these fall within the ambit of custody. And generally speaking, custody is always joint. The court usually encourages both parents to, to remain responsible over the child. Um, usually, that joint custody changes to sole custody only in situations where there have been sexual abuse, for example. But that's a highly serious thing and, and that would be subject to an 
uh, another court making that determination. It is not just purely based on uh, allegations, right? So it's not as easy. Now, um, care and control, on the other hand, refers to the daily care arrangements of the child and usually who the child will be residing with, right? And there are different considerations there. For example, the, the, the one of the key considerations is the, the, the intentions of the child, him himself or herself, who he prefers. But amongst other things, the most important thing that the court will look at is what's in the welfare and best interest of the child. So, of course, if you have a violent partner, uh, party, uh, the court will look at whether it's in the welfare and best interest of the child to be to be placing the child under that violent party's care. Uh, but the court will look at many different things, not just allegations of violence or not just whether or not there's uh, the existence of a PPO. So I think uh, uh, that question, um, the, the, the essential thing that we must understand is that children's issues and using a PPO to try and get a divorce Two separate things. We shouldn't make, mix them up together. Thank you. Uh, it, mashallah, it make things clearer. But on the psychological aspect, right, uh, Sister Inun, how how do you how do you see this PPO? Uh, Mr. Abdurrahman had mentioned earlier, and we just had a question on him on on that uh, issues, right? For you, how how important is for someone to know? or when is the right time to use PPO and why you need to use the PPO and should not undermine the situation that you are in because like what we said, you can go crazy or you can even kill the person because you cannot take it anymore. Mm, I think that uh, once you fear for your for your own uh, even like safety whether mentally or physically then it's a good time to apply for PPO sometimes those who apply for PPO is not necessarily uh, divorce cases only but there are those who you know they want they want to also like actually send the message that okay um this is not right and we want it to stop lah um and that's one way once one of the reasons they apply for PPO as well, um, even even in family, not just among spouse, right? Um, but the impact psychologically, uh, it's it usually la, It takes someone to tell them, you know, uh, like okay, you should you should apply for it lah, because uh, you know he's doing this and this to you, and it affects you so. Um, sometimes, in fact, for us like in our events, I think a lot of them, they actually seek advice. Some, for, for those who attend our events, some of them seek our advice. Sometimes they seek the advice of uh, their friends on this matter because um, they can be able to help better. And even actually, right, for some of these victims, um, they are not even sure where to go. That's why we need to know, like, uh, like Mr. Brahman say about legal aid and such things, free legal aid, because sometimes they think they need to pay. Um, so these kind of things are helpful. So with more information, like people know about it, it's better and they can get the right help faster. I think those around them should inform them and not giving up asking them to do what's right especially if they witness something that is not appropriate um yeah uh mr Abdurrahman, uh i have received some question but i just like to rephrase this is not to question the integrity of the law or whatever but many men just now you mentioned about men also become the victims and in certain circumstances but many men tend to think that uh the woman charter you mentioned right and the woman rights are very strong in singapore so that's how they're going to lose such a case. Is it a hearsay or is it true or yeah, this, 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 or what we call it, uh, this uh, myth need to be sorted out. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so just to confirm the question is many men think that they will be finished off financially. Is it? Is that what you're asking? I think in many ways, uh, they felt that they're not going to win the case. 
Yeah, financially also. I I think there's a perception that uh, the woman will always win, like win the custody, win anything, you know. Yeah, because you mentioned also right, there's not the woman charter, the woman rights and all that. So there's this myth lah, the perception. Is it true or? Yeah, so you have to debunk the myth. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot, uh, a lot actually comes about from the fact that the law is called the woman's charter, right? And we must understand that this law came about at a point in time when uh, it was often the case that a woman's rights were not effectively protected. You know, uh, arguably today the the balance has tipped in. Uh, not, I wouldn't say in favor of the woman, but tipped in in the sense that it is almost equal and everything is a lot fairer today than last time. Maybe 10, 15 years down the road, uh, we'll see the, the 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 name of the law itself, the woman's charter being renamed to something that is more gender neutral. I don't know. But for the time being, sometimes, yes, uh, I, I totally understand what you're saying because sometimes we hear... Uh, people, you know, saying in locker room talk like, uh, ah, yeah, la, woman shatter, la, woman shatter, la, everything, la, the woman will get everything. Uh, I would say that the courts, um, be it the Sharia court or the family court, have have been relatively, uh, to me, or not, not just relatively, have been a lot uh, uh, progressive. They have been progressive a lot uh, when it comes to understanding the nuances between men and women and also how to treat both genders, genders equally, how to balance uh, pre-existing situations in law, for example, the right of maintenance for the woman and also for the children, and how uh, um, uh, at the end of the day, it is not uh, it is divorce or, or going through this kind of family law applications. It's not a situation where we are out there just to penalize the men. It is not that at all. It's about achieving social uh, balance, social justice. Uh, it's about achieving uh, continuity for a woman, how to make sure that even if the woman leaves, uh, a marriage, for example, she can still be strong, independent, and, and, and move on safely. How children can be protected and and and, uh, and ensured that they always will have a roof over their head, uh, over their heads, with someone to take care of them and not be left alone or or or, or uh, abandoned, so to speak. So, the the law is not just about protecting the woman. The law is not just about wanting to side with women. But the law is to achieve uh, many other overarching outcomes when it when it comes to maintaining social balance, maintaining uh, uh, proper options and the availability of, of uh, legal remedies for both parties, be it men or women. Now, interestingly, uh, for example, recent changes in the woman in in the in the this set of laws, for example, if can control is with a husband. Uh, he can potentially he can ask for maintenance from the wife, for example. Uh, in situations where a non-Muslim man is incapacitated uh, to the extent that he can't take care of himself, he can ask for maintenance from the wife. So it is not so much gender specific anymore. It is more holistic, I would say. Uh, on the issue of people saying, oh, yeah, la, the, whatever it is you can say, the woman will always win. I totally disagree. As a, as a practicing lawyer, I have done so many cases where I represent the men and I win. And I win those rights for the men, not because it's a gender war between the men or the woman or the father and the mother, but because when we focus sincerely on what is right when it comes to the best interests and welfare of the children, the court will see what is right in, uh, when it comes to what is in the best interest of the children and the court will focus towards that not about gender, not about husband or wife or mother or father. It's about children and what is best for them. And if it it can be established that it is truly the case that the father is the better caregiver, I have personally handled so many cases where my clients are given care and control over the children because the children truly are better taken care of by them. So it's not about sides, it's not about gender. Uh, thank you, Mr. Abdurrahman, for explaining the whole process and uh, debunk the myth, <laughs> I would say. Because I think that's the normal perception that people will always get. Lah. And even in our campaign, I also heard such uh, saying like, oh, no, this all woman thing, or feminist lah, and all that. But I think we don't see the other side that uh, which we don't realize 
that the court is still fair and listen to every party, whether you are man or woman. Yeah. So uh, there's one question uh, to Mr. Abdurrahman again, quite a number of questions, which is very interesting. What if there, there is a question, right? My sister, she said, uh, has been abused mentally, physically, but never reported my brother-in-law at all for I don't know how long they've been living. Uh. I mean, they've been together marriage. But he said, it seems like nowadays my sister is sort of losing her sanity because the way how she responds. Right? Is it possible for us to report on her behalf or to, to make claims like we had the evidence, we, we, we are the witness of whatever she went through? Is it possible? So I think I asked this first. Huh? They're so quite relating to P. Lane yeah. Okay, so usually in these kind of situations, we have to take things one step at a time. If we think that someone we actually care for is being abused, but they have it's gone on for a substantial amount of time to the extent where maybe that person don't know anymore, cannot take it anymore, and uh, we need to maneuver the situation carefully. If we get to have access to her, if we can bring her out, for example, or if we can tell the husband, Look, I want to spend a day with my sister, uh, we got family function and whatnot, seize the opportunity to try and see whether we can get her. Uh, to see a, to see an expert, whether it's a psychiatrist, or psych it should be psychiatrist, someone who can assess whether or not uh, she's still okay, she's still a sound mind, whether she's still uh, having control over her faculties, for example. Uh, if you can't, uh, if you can't get her out of the house, or if the husband is is abusive to the extent that he tries to cut off all communication, then maybe you can try and explore uh, police assistance. But usually, police assistance would require some form of evidence of, of, of actual abuse. And you, you mentioned just now, maybe if two or three people actually have seen it, have, have witnessed it themselves, and all of them make the police report together, then potentially the police uh, can take action there. Uh, another option uh, that I understand is possible is I think you can make a report to the IMH, but that only can happen if you really have, again, evidence of her acting in a, in a manner that is not normal. Right now, so all of these three examples that I've cited are different examples of how we can bring her to get attention to confirm whether or not she's still normal or not. So that's stage one, right? Stage two is if it is truly found out that she has been pushed to the brink of insanity, and this is not impossible. I have seen a lady uh, who, when she first came to me, she, she couldn't even talk. Uh, she was wearing her pyjamas when she came to my office because um, she had been subject to such uh, great mental anguish by the husband that she started cutting herself, right? And, and I could see her, her, her neck and her chest area was all welts and, and cuts that she had done to herself because uh, she had really been pushed to the, to, to, to the brink of, of, of madness by her husband. Just to give you an example of what he did when she was at home sleeping on their matrimonial bed, he would bring home a prostitute and have sex with a prostitute on the bed beside her. So how do you expect a woman to be able to ex accept that or even take that and not let it get to her mind, right? So this, these kind of things uh, happen. So when you, when you see that, uh, like I said, you need to make sure uh, she gets proper medical attention. Now, if she is totally incapacitated, meaning the, the sister has reached a stage where she cannot make decisions on her own, then we need to go through the court processes to make to help her make decisions on her behalf. And that is usually called a deputyship application, right? And if the husband is around, you're, you're, it's potentially going to be a contested deputy, deputyship uh, uh, application. And these two I have seen before and I have um, had the opportunity of experience. Uh, but that was slightly different because there was a situation where the husband had become mentally incapacitated. Before he was mentally incapacitated, the wife said that she wanted to divorce him. Uh, something happened, he lost his mind, and then they started uh, arguably abusing him at home because he was left on the bed. Uh, he would, uh, he would uh, pass motion and, 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 and urinate in his pants, and they would leave him uh, uh, dirty and, and smelly and, and unattended to on the bed for hours, and he would develop sores all over the body from exposure to... to 
to all of these things, this urine and feces and whatnot. And the siblings uh, arguably had to fight with the wife to, to, to bring him out, to take care of him and to, to get him the proper medical attention. So these things happen. Uh, we would have to, like I said, confirm what is the ailment affecting the party. And after that, we can take the right steps uh, to, to, to help in the decision-making process, whether it's by deputyship or any other ways. Thank you, uh, Mr. Abdurrahman. Wow, I, you know, this kind of cases really hit us. Uh, you know, we learned so much and uh, may Allah ease all these people who are going through such torrid times, difficult times, mentally and uh, spiritually and physically. Right. So this next question is almost similar to the question that I asked you, a bit technically different. Uh, it, it got to do with anxiety. It's like, you know, spouse abuse victim usually hesitate to, to seek legal aid because of the repercussion that they fear, right? For example, uh, whether the abuser, you know, could be the, I mean, their spouse will turn even more violent upon finding out that they have sought legal aid against them. As a lawyer, how do you or search your client's fear in this sort of situation? And what advice or reassurance can you give to this spouse abuse victim regarding their safety when they seek legal aid? Okay, so first things first, no matter what has happened and no matter what may happen, nothing can justify or condone violence. Nothing at all can justify or condone violence. So even if you fear, even if you worry, even you're stressed out, it doesn't make it right. It doesn't make what was done against you right. It's still wrong. Beating a person, uh, being abusive, especially in the close context of a family, of a home, that will never be right. So even if you feel guilty, you feel stressed, you feel worried, stop blaming yourself. You need to go and take, take the necessary action uh, to make sure you are protected and in place in a safe environment. Now, when I mention safe environment, uh, this is nothing new. Okay, many women go through this. So anyone who's watching the video and, and thinking of, about like what should be done, how can I know um, that I'm going to be able to walk away safe? This is nothing new. Many people go through it. Many people get their, the, the attention that they need and deserve. So like I mentioned, the PPO gives you protection in that if, if, if the person who harms you come close, the person who harms you threatens, uh, tries anything funny, he's going to be arrested. It will be an arrestable offense. So please understand that the PPO gives you that good level of protection and, and it's something that you shouldn't play around with. That's one. Two, if, for example, you are subject to violence and I... I, I I had a case which went on for about two years plus because the, the husband was extremely violent and abusive and, and, and uh, kicked the wife out of the house and then tried to, uh, tried to abduct the child and whatnot. If, if you are in such a situation, you should also know and remember that in Singapore, we have women's shelters. You know, there's Casa Rauda, there's Star Shelter. All of these shelters can give you a place to stay uh, with your child or children if necessary uh, so that you have a safe environment while going through your court processes, the legal processes, while rebuilding your life. Maybe you need to find a new job. Maybe you need to, to move and whatnot. And the locations of these shelters uh, are usually secret. It's not published anywhere. Even if you Google it, you can't find the addresses. So you are going to be uh, given that level of protection. And all you need to do is actually, if you are in such a situation, go to your family service center. Go to the family service center nearest to you. Explain to them that you are in this situation of abuse. You can't go home. You fear for your safety if you're going to go home and you need assistance on, on, on having a temporary safe environment for you and all your children to move to while you sort out the legal mess through the network of available lawyers uh, or legal assistance that's, that is available in Singapore. And that can be arranged for you. You've got nothing to worry about. Inshallah. Thank you, Mr. Abdurrahman, for explaining that. And I hope all those who are watching, maybe they are not the victims, but they might be the family or the friends of the victims of abuse. Uh, you need to inform them what Mr. Abdurrahman had said uh, about all these victims. There is shelter 
there is safety in whatever that you do. And if you're going to keep things to yourself and fear the unnecessary fear, then it's not going to change your fate or the situation that you're in. So please help those around you moving forward in their life for them to be better mentally and spiritually and physically. So our uh, next question, uh, okay, before I forget again, if you like to ask, right, we left with two questions. Now, if you anyone like to ask, please send me 906-87106, right? By the next two questions, tak ada, we, we close lah. Otherwise, we continue until Fajar. <laughs> right? So, uh, uh, you know, 906-87106, okay? Yeah. So, uh, Mr. Abdurrahman, the next question is, I try to rephrase uh, because it's too long and jumbling up. <laughs> so, I, I, I know, I, I hope I get it right. Okay, this is about a guy. His wife has infidelity. But throughout the marriage, I think they were married for 12 years. Uh, she, she has been uh, emotionally and physically abused him. And this infidelity has been caught, caught by him quite a number of times. Uh. So now the tussle begins. So she said she wants a divorce. And uh, the tussle began for the custody, of course. That's common. Right? But she said to him, if you do not tell the court that uh, my infidelity situation, I can give you to share the custody. Lah. But he, he said, if not, uh, remember that I will win the case and you will not get to share the custody with the children. So this guy, uh, I don't know who he is, may Allah is him, uh, in, in such a dilemma and fear of what he's going through. Like, like traumatized, gitu, the way he explained also, like you can see like, panic. And... So what's your advice for him in such a complicated emotional situation? So we must understand that children are not chattel. They are not uh, something that we use as a car, money, motorbike. It's not, we don't say, hey, you do this for me, I give you the children. No, that doesn't happen. Children are a responsibility. Children are to be taken care of. Children are for us to take care of and be responsible over. It's not for us to give or take or anything like that. So please anyone who is going through divorce don't have this misconception to think that this is about you you know some people come to me and they say i can i i, I must win the custody i cannot live without my children and i say then you die la better because it's not about you it's about your children what your children need how you're going to take care of them nothing to do with how you feel how your emotional not important when it comes to children children are more important than you okay so it must boil down to a question of who is the better primary caregiver. I always tell my clients, be it the man or the woman, if you know that your spouse is the better primary caregiver, meaning the child more comfortable, closer, more, uh, it is usually the case that your spouse is the one that does 60 to, to 80 percent of the caregiving, then let it stay that way. It's bad enough that you are going through a divorce. You know, a divorce is something that is very unsettling. You are basically shaking the bedrock of the family. Uh, how are the children going to handle it? How are they going to, 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 to think? How are they going to accept it? Are they, are they, how is it going to em emotionally and mentally affect the children? It's very difficult to say. So why, want, why would you want to make it worse? by subjecting your children to a custody battle, to a big all-out fight between you and your spouse. The reality is, if you are married long enough to have a child, you will know between you and your spouse who is better. Not better person, nothing to do with personality, but who is better at taking care of the child. And if it's true that the other party is the one, then please put aside your emotion, put aside your ego, prioritize the needs of the child and let that happen. Okay, that's the first thing I have to say. Now, second is, uh, the gentleman says that he had been abusive to his wife, but his wife also committed adultery or was uh, or there was infidelity by her against him. Now, the thing is, this is just a bad situation. The husband is wrong for committing abuse. The wife also is wrong for 
uh, committing adultery. But then at the end of the day, what the court will do is the court will look at the situation, understand that both parties need to part ways, and the court will make a decision on all of the, the issues relating to the divorce, whether it's the house, whether it's a CPF claim, whether it's the claim for nafkah ida, nafkah muta'ah. So the question of who is right and who is wrong, what should have been done, who committed what and, and, and what not, is, is something that, that, yes, while relevant, it is not the be all and end all. So we must understand that. The court is, is going to look at more things than just about uh, who slept with who or who beat who. It's, it's, impo it's more important to look at the case in its entirety. So things like your division of matrimonial assets, your nafkaida, your, your muta'a and all that, the court will look at everything. The court will look at your financial contributions, your non-financial contributions to the marriage and whatnot. It is not just a question of who did what wrong. It's also about who did what right. So these are things that you need to bear in mind. Uh, lastly, uh, when it comes to the children, um, just now, uh, what the description that was given was uh, we can share, right? Now, sharing is one thing, but I'm, please also understand that never uh, subject your children to a situation of split custody unnecessarily, meaning one with one party and the other with another party, because children are their own support network. They, when they, when they, when when their parents are going through divorce, they come closer and they rely on each other to be that support network for each other. If you break that apart, as well, you, can you imagine how devastating it's going to be for the kids? So please don't do that. Uh, that that is my sincere suggestion. For the gentleman uh, that posed that question, I think he should he should he should relax, take a breather, take a step back, uh, assess the situation independently, and think about think properly about. Uh, who the children are closer to and who should be looking after the children. If uh, I, I think from the question, he said the infidelity has been going on for about 11 years, so the marriage will be longer than that. Presumably, the children are quite big. You're looking at maybe 8, 9, 10-year-old children. They probably already have their own opinions. Take the time to understand them, talk to them, sound them out before we go for an un unnecessary fight in court. That is what I would say. Thank you, sir. I think, inshallah, we learn a lot uh, through this question alone. I just want to ask you, since we got custody again, when can a child decide whether he wants to follow his mom or his dad? When is the right age that the court allows that? Okay, so, so generally speaking, uh, the position in court usually is once a child hits seven years of age, they can be interviewed by the court, can be. Mm. So this, this number seven is based on the uh, a general estimate of when the child becomes mumayis, right? Meaning he can discern between left and, uh, between right and wrong. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's just a general position. When a child attains mumayis, of course, it's going to be different for each child and all that. So that's a, that's a, it is something that is debatable. Also nowadays, uh, some some judges are okay with interviewing. Some judges may prefer not to interview. This is something that is that is uh, potentially debatable. Uh, we also commonly have the services of third party providers uh, mm -hmm. who do things like uh, custody evaluation reports and also social welfare reports that can assist the court in deciding who is the better caregiver for the children. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, we call it clarification. Uh. I think a lot of people also do not know in, in, in that how that process works. Uh, this is the last question. Unfortunately, we cannot drag you till Subo, but this is the last question. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, spouse abuse victims are often isolated in more ways than one. They may be physically isolated. You mentioned that before, right? They were taken away from their family, so like socially isolated, psychologically and emotionally isolated. Or all the above. Uh. The ongoing pandemic, which happened now the eight months, has unfortunately, uh, we call it exacerbated this, this state of isolation. During the circuit break, for instance, police stated that reports of family violence increased by 22% in just one month. As a lawyer, how do you navigate this state of increase? isolation for spousal abuse cases to ensure that they are all well taken care of even during pandemic times? 
Okay, so um, it's a relatively long question. Uh, and everything in the question is, is true, I agree with it. The, definitely the, 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 the COVID situation, the pandemic, the circuit breaker, being stuck at home, not being able to go out, all of these, all of these uh, circumstances exacerbated the, the existence of violence, the, the potential for violence and the occurrence of it. Because even in other organizations that I volunteer at, I, I, we, we receive feedback. The numbers spiked by 10 to 15 percent uh, in terms of reports on on uh, domestic abuse. So everything that was asked in the question is correct. I agree with all of that. Uh, and and the last part was how do I as a lawyer ensure this doesn't happen? The truth is I am one person. I cannot make so many changes. Uh, and truthfully, I know many good lawyers, uh, all of whom feel for their clients and want to do the best for their clients. So many of us. What we do uh, and what we can do, especially in the situation of the pandemic, is we do things like this, right? Uh, I think in the last six months, the amount of Facebook Live I have done to discuss about topics like this have gone, on, have gone up exponentially. Uh, I have also uh, increased the number of video interviews with clients, clients who, who can't come to the office physically. I make sure they still access to justice. If they need help, need assistance, just drop me a WhatsApp. And I will get back to them and I'll arrange a tele interview or video interview or a Zoom meet. So you definitely still can get assistance and get help and get to talk to a lawyer, even if it's a kid breaker, you're stuck at home, you have an abusive partner who isolates you. As long as you have a phone, we can help you. So all of these options and op opportunities are there. It's just about Googling, doing a bit of research, finding out where and how and who you want to meet. Thank you, uh, Mr. Abdul Rahman. Uh, this is our last question. Uh, before we end tonight's session, right, uh, is there anything that you'd like to share with all our audience who's watching right now and who's going to watch later on tomorrow and so on? Yeah. Well, I think uh, I can safely say that, that uh, violence is something that's not to be tolerated. Uh, but realistically, it happens. And we all know it happens. Uh, apart from physical violence, there's also this, to me, what is more unacceptable is situations of <coughs> mental anguish and also emotional anguish that, that people go through because of uh, the actions of the spouse. So uh, I guess my parting comment would be if you are trapped in this situation, and I use the word trapped purposely, if you are trapped in this situation, understand that the trap is something that's only in your mind. You can take the steps to get out of it and help is just uh, an arm's length away. All you need to do is reach out and there will be someone who will respond and help pull you out of your mess. And, and no one has to handle anything alone. You can always get the relevant help to, to go through uh, whatever problems it is that you're going through and come out of it unscathed. Thank you, Mr. Abdul Rahman. Uh, with this, we end tonight live session with him. And I think it's uh, interesting I think uh, all of us learn so much uh, from the questions and also understanding how to go about with the spouse abuse, the PPO, the custody, and so on. There's a lot of uh, complicated issues that we had discussed with the right person here. So if you want to keep in touch with him, uh, he's at Abdurrahman Law Corporation, ARLC. Very easy to remember, ARLC, right? Abdurrahman Law Corporation. So inshallah, he will give you a legal advice. Uh, I have sent, I have recommend some of my friends to seek his advice, and all of them said he's good. And uh, inshallah, Allah preserve him to all the good things that he had done. And uh, with this, we say thank you to him. May Allah preserve him. May he continue to do all the good work uh, for the people who need his help and advice. And, yeah, and to all those who are undergoing this sort of situation. We pray that Allah remove you from that sort of situation. May Allah give you the courage. May Allah remove your fear. And may Allah assist you in every opening that you are trying to seek. Right? Uh, keep look out for our Sacred Power of Love online this weekend. We have two days. You can choose either one of the day. Uh, this is our 11 years we have been going. So it's about spiritual, mental, and lots of things that we go through as a human being in our daily life, especially on this pandemic. It's online. If you need free ticket, message us on our Facebook or our IG. We can give you a free ticket, right? So we have lots of walks. Or, uh, we have so many 
people from all walks of life and attended this event over the years, right? So with this, we say, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, everyone. May peace be upon you. May Allah bless your sleep and your night. And uh, may Allah suffice your need and ease your affairs. Goodbye. A good night. <laughs>